I would like to introduce now our third speaker. David Reif is a New York-based nonfiction writer and policy analyst. He spent more than 15 years observing and writing about humanitarian emergencies. He's published in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the Atlantic, and internationally in Le Monde and El Pais. As a distinguished journalist, Reef witnessed the collapse of Yugoslavia and covered the war in Bosnia. In his latest book, which I have a copy of here, entitled In Praise of Forgetting, Historical Memory and Its Ironies, he argues that the function of remembrance is not always positive. Too often, collective historical memory has led to war rather than to peace, to rancor rather than reconciliation, to exacting revenge rather than committing to the hard work of forgiveness. Reef asks whether in some places and at some moments in history, what has ensured the health of societies and individuals alike has been not their capacity for remembering, but their ability to forget. Here's a quotation that um, is at the heart of this meditation on forgetting. He writes, it is a psychological truism that an individual's effort to recover his or her own memories, whether available or repressed, when done properly and seriously in a therapeutic context, can be healing. Unfortunately, this has led to the psychological pop culture that to be able to remember a traumatic experience is the necessary first step in coming term to terms with it. And the same is now thought to be the case with the collective memory of social groups. What may be constructive for a therapist treating a patient's individual trauma could be highly dangerous politically when nations, peoples, or social groups act on their collective traumas. I'm extremely grateful to David for coming to speak to us today. Please welcome him. Of that. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, I think I'm supposed to switch something on here. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I'm going to make a slight apology. I was not here uh, in the morning for a, because of a ridiculous household emergency. Uh, so I didn't hear the first two presentations, which, alas, means I may end up recapitulating themselves in a way that will cause you to throw various root vegetables in my direction. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, apologies for that. If I, obviously, if I hear too many of you sort of moving around in your seats, I, I'll realize that that's exactly what's happened and uh, try to skip on to something that might actually be of interest. Um, I've spent a very long part of my very long life already uh, working on basically in war zones and zones of extreme poverty uh, with what we call, for lack of a better word, humanitarian emergencies. It's not a term I particularly like and not a term that I actually think is particularly useful indeed. You could argue that in certain cases at least it's a prophylactic against thought. I'll give you the obvious example, which uh, is Auschwitz. Oh, I always worry that uh, today people would say Auschwitz was a humanitarian emergency. And lest you think that's far-fetched, there have been great crimes in the last 40 years, 50 years, that have been described just that way, which is to say completely depoliticized, completely taken out of historical context and, and referred to in effect as if there, there was either a natural, the way you might refer to a natural disaster, uh, a hurricane, a, a tsunami, whatever. So that's where I come from. I come from a, if you like, a, the conviction uh, of that 
the, the further away we get from politics and history, uh, the worse shape we're going to be in. That's why the book that uh, Craig was kind enough to quote from was, in many ways, uh, an effort to put um, history uh, and, and politics back into the questions of memory. In other words, to desacralize memory. Because it does seem to me right now, at least the dominant strain, in both the version of uh, support for collective memory that is triumphalist, that is to say the glories of our wonderful country or empire or what have you, or the victim version, uh, which is we must remember all the sufferings that said empire or country has inflicted on its marginalized and, and its colonized. In either version, I, it's obviously all things being equal, better to remember than to forget, but not everywhere and not at all times. This, I would argue, is particularly true when nobody, in the aftermath of wars, when nobody's won. It was quite simple for all the difficulties, but it still was simple in a situation where one side wins decisively to impose, a, as it were, a unitary version of memory. We see that in Rwanda right now. There is no space in the Rwandan political landscape for alternate memories than the ones the government puts forward. Uh, but on the other hand, if you take most wars, don't end with the overwhelming, crushing victory of one side or another. Most wars end in messy compromises. Look at the Balkans, look at Northern Ireland, uh, and many others. And in those cases, who is going to impose the memory? Is it going to be some... Uh, where, where does the authority, the legitimacy come from? Now, obviously, within societies, people are free to labor as they will and as they feel it's right to work. But you're not in a situation where you can impose curricula, for example, as the Americans, British, and French did in their areas, I suppose the Russians did too, in their areas of occupied Germany after 1945. You're not going to do that in Northern Ireland, I assure you. You'd start the war all over again if you had one version. And at the same time, if you said, well, everyone was at fault except the nice people who didn't want to fight and wanted peace, you will find, I think, in Northern Ireland, a place I know pretty well, that a majority of people will say, that's rubbish. Our cause was just. And we're not having our kids learn a version that, as it were, delegitimizes the thing we fought and bled and died and killed for. So it's in that context of the political that I'm, I, I operate from. And I sort of, this is all on one level a certain amount of throat clearing, because I want you to know, you know, full disclosure, where I'm coming from in all of this. When I talk about displacement, about migration, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, it, anyway, it seemed useful. So let me go to displacement. Some obvious things are true, I, I think undeniably are facts. One is that this is a period of mass migration. It's true not only, <clears throat> as you might imagine, if you only read the press in the global north, an issue of migration from the global south to the global north, but it, in very large measure, it's an issue of mass migration within the global south. Um, if you go to any region of the world, practically, you will find migrants from the poorer uh, parts of that region in the richer parts of that region. So <laughs> Senegal is full of Ivorians, for example. Uh, Lima is now full of Venezuelans, uh, to give you another example, as, is mo as are most prosperous countries and even some poor countries in South America. Uh, the Venezuelan move, just to give you an example of 
mass migration is almost as big as the Syrian in terms of people leaving the country. Obviously, it's not nearly so large in terms of displacement within the country. So you have this world in flux. And you have, by definition, I think, a, a degree of incompatible narratives. An obvious version is the narrative of escape, which might be called one of the principal narratives of, that migrants have, escaping from the Maras in Central America, from the, the gangs in Central America, not because you think the United States is so wonderful, but because it at least seems like a safe place where you might be able to make a go of things. Uh, and anyway, it's not infernal as Central America has increasingly become. So there's that narrative. And then, of course, in the receiver countries, there's the narrative of invasion, which is the narrative of we have a perfectly um, coherent polity, less, more or less, and suddenly all these people with different habits and customs and foods and even in some cases, though not all religions, uh, come, races, uh, come and disturb everything. They, they're overwhelming us. And obviously, the extent to which you take this second narrative seriously depends a great deal on how uh, important you think migration is in demographic terms. Uh, is, it going, is it going to replace uh, native populations or turn them into comparative minorities where they'd been majorities. In the Balkans, I lived in Sarajevo during the siege. Uh, there was a joke that was going around as Yugoslavia collapsed and burned around us, which was that basically the political rhetoric of the various belligerents was, why should I be a minority in your country when you could be a minority in my country? Uh, now, you know, that's a serious thing because there's, there's dis displacement, inner displacement to take the, one of the words of the title, what words in the title of this, uh, this conference can be simply not recognizing the people around you, the people you grew up in. It doesn't necessarily, by the way, and I think this is a point I would, I think worth emphasizing anyway, it doesn't necessarily have to be migration. It can be changes in mores. I mean, people in Ireland of 50 or over live in a country they don't recognize from their childhoods. The Ireland, Catholic Ireland is, is dead and gone. The churches are empty, except for some immigrants, interestingly, uh, for, from Eastern Europe, and very old people. But if you'd gone to Ireland in 1965 or 1970 or even 1975, you would have found a place quite dominated by religion, by, by, the, by the church and by the power of the church, which was, in effect, institutionalized with the creation of the state in 1921. Uh, now, those people are displaced as well. You're 55 years old, you wake up, and you, you look around you, and you see that 25 out of the 26 countries, uh, counties, excuse me, in Ireland voted for gay marriage in a place where these, when you were growing up, indeed when you were in university probably, such things were absolutely unmentionable, let alone considered to be absolutely fine and laudable even. Um, that's, that's a kind of displacement, a psychic displacement, which a lot of people all over the world are facing, I think. Uh, you know, there's an old, Lin Yutang writes somewhere, uh, home is the food of child, are the foods of childhood. And those foods have changed a lot in the last 40 years, as they were bound to do. It's not the first time, the great expansion of European peoples in empire and colonization and genocide was another example of such if you will, to use very uh, um, euphemistic language, displacement. So I'm not 
for a minute suggesting that this migration is, is uh, this displacement is uh, unique or maybe even necessarily as wrenching as, uh, as others that precede it. Now, it may become so. I'm not, I wrote a book about the global food system, the crisis of the global food system, which is kind of a rather rancorous attack on philanthropy and, and the UN system and a lot of other nice things. Uh, some years ago, and uh, I purposely stayed away from two subjects, global warming and GMOs. In the latter case, GMOs, because I simply don't think I have the scientific news to have the right to an opinion. I have sympathies, but they tend to be of a very conventional, sort of progressive kind, which means they're worth less than nothing. Uh, but, uh, but the other thing about which I actually have some opinions and even have done some reading, is climate change. But of course, none of us know whether how bad it's going to get. We know it's going to get bad, but uh, we don't know how bad. If, for example, a, a really grim scenario, the three degree Celsius scenario were to come true, then there will be a mass migration of a type unheard of in the history of the world, because whole countries will go underwater, Bangladesh for one. Uh, or a great deal of Bangladesh, for one, great part of Bengal and uh, eastern India, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, then it will be, but, I've, but again, it's not really possible to, to know. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll, at some point we'll know, and probably our descendants will piss on our graves for what we didn't do, but, uh, but it's not sure, and therefore you can't, I don't think, you have to be careful with migration. On the other hand, you know, the push factors are obvious. Uh, people in Europe make uh, 10 times more on average than people in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, you'd have to be rather foolish if there were a possibility of going to a place where you could make uh, more than a tenth of, of what is possible, uh, not to risk it, at least for more adventurous and enterprising young people. Uh, I never, you know, particularly since, as we know from the work of the economist Branko Milanovic, the, the, uh, uh, the, the most uh, defining factor in um, your prosperity and your economic life chances are either where you're born or where you live. Uh, and so, again, these are rational choices. Will people, uh, will there be much more migration? Will we get wars to prevent migrants from coming? Will climate change make such migration literally unstoppable with or without walls? And parenthetically, I think it's a progressive fallacy to imagine walls don't work. Walls actually work quite well. Uh, that doesn't mean they're moral or one should not resist their construction, but it's, it's wishful thinking to imagine that they don't change things. As we see with the de facto wall that's being created across the Sahel to prevent people from getting to the ports of the Maghreb. Um, now, again, this is, I'm not speaking, of course, in moral terms. But what does this displacement do it, one thing it does is it puts everything up for grabs, including all sorts of settled identities. Let me tell you a, a story, a biographical story, uh, of perhaps illustrative of how things have not changed. In about 1900, uh, my paternal great-grandparents were uh, who were uh, Jews from the Russian Empire, uh, decided to leave as hundreds of thousands of Jews were leaving that part of the world and Sicilians and Poles and other peoples in, in huge numbers toward the Americas. And they went to a port of exit and they took a boat which landed them here in New York, in Ellis Island. But 
I've looked at the shipping records. I spend a great deal of my life in Argentina, and I've looked at shipping records in terms of those boats. And for every two that went to the United States, one went to Buenos Aires. Uh, and they, my, I'm fairly certain that my paternal great-grandparents didn't have the faintest idea where they were going. They just knew about where they were leaving. They wanted to go to America. But America could have been Argentina or, um, or the United States. And they would have had, presumably, they taken the next boat to Buenos Aires. I would speak with a somewhat different accent uh, if I were still around after the 1970s. Um, now, that's the same as you see with the migrants coming up from sub-Saharan Africa. They are not, they are two versions of that migration. One is you're trying to find your relatives in town X or country Y. That's what the people in Calais or around Calais on the, the French North Sea ports are, uh, channel ports are doing. They're trying to get to England not because France is so terrible, but because the support systems, the relatives, etc., are in the UK from previous migrations. But the other version is, much like my great-grandparents, we want to go to Europe. And we're in Europe. In a way, the migrants are the most convinced Europeans, because for them, paradoxically, there's Europe. And, you know, some places are said to be better than others. Germany has better welfare payments than, and services than Spain. But people want, since what they're really fixed on is getting out, they, they are, they're Europeans. They don't, I've spent some time in various places in the last couple of years talking to people, in, mostly in Italy, and in, in these very awful reception centers and sometimes in churches. Um, and I don't have the sense that the concept of Italy or of France or of Germany is the main story. Again, so, and that's a transformation. If you suddenly have a great many people in your population who really don't think of themselves as French or German or Italian, but want to think of themselves as European. That will change a lot of things in the course of a generation or two. Now, it's possible, as with the Jews and other immigrants uh, a century or more ago from poor parts of Europe to the Americas, that there'll be some kind of process of assimilation and identification within national states that will make this prediction uh, unwarranted. But I wonder, not least because the states to which European immigrants came, Argentina, Brazil, United States, some degree Mexico, were states with very pronounced national feeling. It was an age of states. Now the state is weakened, considerably weakened, by a lot of factors, including a kind of borderless capitalism that, um, that sort of doesn't really acknowledge the importance of states. Philanthro philanthropy, to come back to my original humanitarian concerns, uh, is, you know, is an alternative to it. The Gates Foundation with its $37 billion endowment and its one point whatever billion dollar annual spend is the third largest contributor, for example, to the World Health Organization's polio campaigns. That's much more powerful than most states. And I don't see any evidence that that's going to change. So it's imaginable in two generations if, if very different terms of reception are established, that is to say, if ways are found to reconcile native populations to the arrival of new populations. You could imagine the immigrants becoming good Europeans. Whether states can still do that assimilation thing 
that they did in the second half of the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century, I'm by no means convinced of. Um, also, it's very likely that most people who came in the previous waves found employment. And this immigration is coming at a time when jobs are being cut and where far from work is a great assimilator. But it's not clear those work that work uh, will be on offer. You have um, the reports from Davos that were interesting where in public, according to at least one Guardian report that I saw, people, <coughs> rich uh, uh, business people would say, well, we have to find a way to deal with artificial intelligence that wouldn't, uh, that won't displace people, won't leave people unemployed. But then, according to the chairman of Infosys, the Indian uh, company, uh, in private, the same businessmen were asking Infosys, and Infosys, excuse me, and Wipro and other companies of that kind, SAP, uh, to uh, speed up the process so they could lay off more workers. Uh, so we're not, we're not clear what this displacement will lead to in practical material terms. Now, I'm the least qualified person to talk about psychology that perhaps is in this room, I would wager. Maybe there's one exception. Uh, but uh, I, I, so I'm not going to talk about psychic things in, in, in any kind of uh, analytics. That's because I'm royally unqualified to do so. But I am going to talk about material, uh, as it were, what, what material things contribute to some of this inner displacement. And the most obvious, and this doesn't necessarily involve migrants, is the web, is the fact that we now are caught up in basically affinity groups that know no borders. I play Scrabble online with someone in Hong Kong. I don't play Scrabble with my neighbor or go down to the local park. I am, I have the same tastes in food as someone in Buenos Aires, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in that context, those are destabilizing of the certainties of, well, these are display, these are psychic displacements, virtuality, is a form of psychic displacement. And if anything, we're going to live more in those terms. I've always struck, I'm not on Facebook, but uh, I, because I'm too secretive, and I certainly don't want anyone knowing where, where I am or what I'm doing that I can avoid. But uh, it's, I often talk to people who say, well, they got a message from a friend on Facebook, and I'll say, oh, when did you see this person last? And they'll look at me as if I'm the village idiot, which I suppose in some ways I am. And, uh, and they'll say, well, I haven't seen them in ages. But as if to say, subtext, uh, it doesn't matter. I'm in touch with them constantly in virtual, in the virtual world, in the web. And that's true of the migrants also, by the way. I mean, you are. Uh, people are talking all the time. The minute you, you, you see people with cell phones in Lampedusa, the island where a lot of people <coughs> have been brought ashore be before the new, uh, what would you call it, uh, xenophobic government. Let's, let, me, let me leave it there. Uh, government in Italy closed those, it effectively closed those ports uh, for all, in, in all practical purposes. Um, People would be talking, texting. And if you go to any neighborhood, immigrant neighborhood, anywhere in the world, people are constantly in touch with home. Now, that's a very different world from the world of my great grandparents who sent letters, perhaps, which may or might or might not arrive. And the virtual world's a very strange world because, on the one hand, it lets you leap over barriers of space and to some extent time because you could read things at different moments. But at the same time, 
it doesn't alleviate your immediate suffering. There's a terrible story about an expedition some years ago at Everest that, <coughs> that they got trapped halfway up the mountain and they knew they were going to die. So they set messages, text messages, I don't know what other kinds of messages, on their mobile phones and iPads to their loved ones in Japan and in Europe. It was a mixed expedition saying goodbye. But so there's this immense power of being able to contact anyone in the world and the fact that this immense power doesn't change anything about whether you were going to live or die in a snowdrift on the side of one of the highest peaks in the world. Now, we don't, we don't have the language. We don't have the political structures. We don't have societies that are even remotely fit for purpose in dealing with this new world. Even our language, when we start to talk about these things, sort of eventually ties itself up in knots. Who are, pe are people migrants? I mean, take all these things. Are they undocumented persons? Are they illegal aliens? Are they migrants or are they refugees? Are the native population, I don't even know those words in English, but you know, uh, natives from the source, uh, to use the French expression, français de souche, uh, or are they, or are, is this description of the, the settled populations in receiver countries uh, incorrect? What do you do about languages? I spend a bit of time, we were talking about this at lunch, in South Africa nowadays. And depending on where you are in South Africa, in Johannesburg, which is where I normally go, you can speak a lot of languages, to, uh, European languages, that are not, as it were, native to South Africa. For example, most of the people in downtown Johannesburg who are, want to watch your car or sell you something are from DRC or Burundi or Rwanda, or, uh, or Congo Brazzaville. And those people, you don't speak very good English, and certainly don't speak Zulu, or, uh, they, but they do speak French. And what do you do with that? What do you do with language? <clears throat> There's a campaign in South Africa to, as it were, somewhat dis, disempower Afrikaans as the colonial language. Now, it's complicated because there are three million non-white people who speak Afrikaans and it's not clear. I mean, I, I'm well aware of the controversy. But that doesn't even begin to address all these new people who don't speak, to, who arrive not speaking Koza or Zulu or Afrikaans or English. <clears throat> so how do, you, how do you do that? What do you do with that? Because it's not good enough to talk about assimilation. The social contract can't be all on the side of those with power. It doesn't work that way. I mean, it may work that way in the short term or if people are willing to commit terrible crimes. But if they're short of that, the social contract has to benefit, as it were, both sides um, of it. Otherwise, it's not a contract, it's just a tyrannical diktat that sooner or later is going to be undone. And again, coming back to this question of language, I don't think we, we have the language for what seems at the same time to be a process of kind of post-modern feudal economies of these great capitalist, you know, post-national uh, capitalist groups, nativist groups, migrants, and then other, you know, other other displacements. Uh, I don't know. I don't even know if I were to try to. I read. You know, a book comes out every year or so, maybe every six months or so, trying to explain what's happened to the world. I must say, each one of them seems to me more bogus than the other because it, it assumes that we actually can explain this. I'm not certain we're there yet. 
I'm not certain we know how to talk about displacement, outer displacement, or for that matter, inner displacement, in the sense I've been using it, of course, not in the sense that you uh, analysts or people who know something about the psyche are, are using it. That, again, I'm not qualified to do. I think we're, I think we're in a period of, of absolutely extraordinary incoherence. And, you know, how do you make moral judgments? How do you make economic judgments? How do you even make judgments of interest in a period of massive cognitive dissonance and incoherence? I, I don't have an answer to that. I'm much better at knocking things down than building things up, and uh, as will have been apparent to you. Uh, the, um, uh, but I know that's where we find ourselves. And I think, I think there's a great deal of struggle just to get to lucidity. Forget about solutions. So I hope having provoked you sufficiently, uh, I'll end there and open it up if I may. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Great. Uh, you know, it's like, it's like, oh, sorry. You know, it's like, it's kind of interesting you mentioned that like we're living in a time of incoherence and also like you most, you mentioned like a uh, postmodernism. Like, um, I study philosophy and like a, a major theme of like postmodern thought has been like has has been like how the West has like for has always like privileged like us uh, speaking because like it's it's always seen it as being like um as being like the as being like the uh, I guess like as Derrida would say like the highest level of presence and that like um and that like it, it it's never been it's it's never like um it's never like a privileged writing because writing has always been seen as disparate and like, um, and like, you know, um, and like it kind of like distorts meaning. Like, so I, I, I guess like, sorry, um, I guess at the, at the risk of making like a, a circumlocution, like do, do you think that like, do you think that there's a way of like um, handling like this fundamental incoherence by, by like, I, I guess like, by by not like focusing so much on like the on the easy distinctions that are like you know th that are like proximal to us, but instead of like instead of like trying to understand like the the disparate like nature of like of um of like the world we now find ourselves like. You know, um, well, I'm not sure. I take. I mean, I I, I when I use postmodern, I'm more thinking of uh, Microsoft and. Uh, you know, Huawei than I am about uh, about uh, the sense that I, if I understand Derrida, which I probably don't, uh, I think he was using it and other postmodern theorists use it. But I mean, I don't know that, I mean, every time, I, I think these are mammoth tasks. I don't think that you can wish them away by saying, well, if we just uh, under, if we paid less attention, say, to the spoken word and more to something like, else. It was like, sorry uh, no, to interrupt. It, it was more of a metaphor, though. Like, I guess like what I meant is that like, um, I meant that like, instead of like trying to understand like the, I guess, you know, like the, like the easy, like, uh, like, you know, like, di like the easy distinctions that like we've held on to before. Like, but in instead of like trying like to uh, ba basically like to, like to, to try to understand like the other in like in like in their like in their otherness, if that if that makes any sense, like of like try, trying like to um like in, in, instead of like trying like to understand the world that like we um like we I guess like we it's like it's hard again I know it's kind of hard to explain like the point that I'm trying to make, but um, yeah, I have to say I'm not actually following you. I'm sorry. Okay, um, like this this conference is about like di like displacement, right? Is there? I guess I guess what I'm trying to say is like is is there a way of like is there a way of like un of like 
essentially understanding displacement without trying to place it, you know, like without, like with, with, like with, with, without trying like to co-opt it into like a, into a framework that, that, that fits like what we've understood for so long. Okay, fair enough. I, uh, my short answer is no, uh, there isn't. Because you're not talking about an academic exercise or even a thought experiment. You're talking about the people who have to be persuaded to think differently about the other are not people who are, tend to be interested in debates about otherness. They're the neighbors of, or they're the people who live in a neighborhood that then other people live in. I mean, I, look, I'm an anti-utopian. So any utopian argument made to me is one that I pretty much reject. I don't see those, I, I see messy compromises. I think the best one can hope for in the world are what some philosophers call modus vivendi. That is to say, people, as it were, they may not like each other, they may not even understand each other all that well, but they decide and structures of power are, are transformed so that that decision is, is enforceable to tolerate each other. That already seems to me like a lot. I mean, we live in a very funny time. We live, for example, in a time where for the first time in human history, as far as I know, at least since Neolithic times, um, uh, war is not the constant. I mean, for, war is the constant in human history until very recently. I personally, pessimist that I am, don't even think that's gonna last. But let's say uh, it does. Um, okay, then we have, you know, a new, we're, we're gonna have other ways of thinking about conflict. But as far as understanding the other in all her otherness or, you know, words like that seem to me to, they're, they're, they're lovely words. But I don't know where that gets me in an immigrant neighborhood in Berlin where there are a bunch of people from the East who didn't live with immigrants until very recently, until unification, and where everybody is at loggerheads. I mean, you know, I'm afraid that's a little too John Lennon-ish for me, if you'll, you know, imagine there's no heaven, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I don't see the world that way. Now, you can say, well, here's a guy who spent 20 years in war zones and wasn't very cheerful even to begin with. You know, kind of Eeyore wearing a flak jacket, if you'll permit me to put it that way. But, I mean, that's sort of how I see it. Well, I've either bored you to death or I've really depressed you. Uh, but uh, there's certainly no need. We can all take a coffee break. It's absolutely illicit if no one else wants to chime in. Um, I was really intrigued by your um, the in praise of forgetting uh, argument, but it was tantalizingly, teasingly um, read out, I think, by, by Craig, and then you, you referenced it at the beginning, but I don't see the link to what you've discussed in relation to displacement. So could you, could you say how your, how your thesis, that collective memory and uh, collective memory processes can be harmful rather than healing. How does that play out in the context of displacement and migration? Well, I mean, I partly started there because, I, as I said in the first minutes of what I was, my talk, uh, uh, that I wanted you to sort of know where I'm coming from more generally and to emphasize my very materialist, somewhat tediously Weberian notions of politics as the central sort of way of understanding things. Uh, I, if Craig hadn't read out that quote, it's quite possible I wouldn't have mentioned it and tried to start the, um, the talk somewhat differently. But I think that what happens in uh, um, migrations also 
in many cases, it's very helpful to remember. And again, my, the premise of this little book, uh, meditation, whatever you want to call it, is uh, that it's still, you know, if one can remember without danger, whether collectively, well, collectively, you, you, um, that's great. But that there are a whole bunch of places, perhaps disproportionately places that I worked over the years, where I see memory as a weapon of war. Uh, and if you, like me, think that I don't believe that, I don't believe all good things go together. I've never believed, for example, that you can't have peace without justice. I think that's pure wishful thinking. You can't have a just peace without justice, but that's a tautology. Um, you can have a cold peace, you can have a peace. But I speak as someone who used to scrape body parts off the walls in Sarajevo. So I'm not very sympathetic to the view that, you know, that isn't peace. Uh, I tend to think peace is when the guns shut up. Uh, and, uh, and in many cases, I think that's the best one can hope for. Not always, and of course if you can have both, that's great. But of course, we all come with our histories, our mythologies, our versions of community, our allegiances, our dislikes, our animosities. And migration by, by moving everything around is, is likely to increase that. I'll give you one example of an effect. It has a real world effect, which is diasporas tend to be much more extremist than countries, in, than people who stay. Uh, the Croatian diaspora in North America, for example, was far more fanatically nationalist and anti-Yugoslav than people in Croatia were. Uh, you know, you see the same, uh, the support for Tamil Elam uh, is another example of that. Uh, to some extent, Sikh communities, sympathies for Khalistan, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I can give you a bunch of examples. So again, one, one effect of displacement is actually reinforces the fantasy of home. Uh, it may not be true anymore, but you know, there, were, there used to be more pro-peace Jews in Israel than in the diaspora. I'm not sure that's still true, but it certainly was true at one point. So that's, that would just be an example I could give you of, of how this displacement affects people. The other thing is people carry their feuds with them. I mean, all you have to do is walk around a mixed Turkish-Kurdish neighborhood in Berlin to see that nobody's dropped anything uh, in, in such conflicts. And you will get the two different flags, depending on which coffee bar you go in, or at least many that I know. I used to live there. Um, I, I, I mean, those are some examples. I could probably go on, but you probably, I mean, it's sort of clear. So you spoke earlier about, um, I guess, all these examples of sort of wars that don't have clear winners and losers, and who controls then sort of the frame of the dialogue post-war. And I'm thinking that, you know, you gave a bunch of examples, um, Africa and Europe, and I'm thinking that we obviously are an example of that ourselves here, um, whose civil war is not completely resolved in a lot of the citizens. Um, we have a lot of people who still proudly, you know, fly Confederate flags. Um, we've tried to sort of, we, meaning the government, sort of take charge of the frame of discourse with everything from Jim Crow to, you know, mass incarceration to voter suppression. We just saw that a few months ago. Still happening very actively, police brutality. I'm wondering if you can sort of apply your ideas about memory versus forgetting to here and now. Well, I actually do a bit of that in this little book, uh, we're talking about the memory of the Civil War. I mean, look, the United States is a very peculiar country historically. It, one side won the Civil War, the war itself, overwhelmingly, and the other side won the memory war. I mean, that's what actually happened here. 
And it was a process. It did start out that way. You could argue, a lot of people argue, uh, that had Reconstruction been allowed to continue, had Hayes for rather, President Hayes for rather mundane uh, electoral reasons, he needed South Carolina's votes to get himself elected in the Electoral College. Had Hayes not promised to do away with the Reconstruction, it might have been different. But what happened was that the history, except among African Americans, got sanitized. It became a war between brothers, a tragic conflict, uh, you know, in which both sides were valiant. Lee surrendering to Grant at Appomattox, you know, and riding off on his lovely horse, Traveler, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I'm old enough to have lived through the centenary of the beginning of the war, and I remember very well the equivalents. TV shows. There was a television show in America in the 1950s and early 60s called The Grey Ghost. The Grey Ghost was a show. It was quite popular. It was the most popular show on television. Let's not exaggerate. But it was quite popular. It was about a Confederate guerrilla officer based on the life of a man called John Singleton Mosby, who was a, a, a sort of guerrilla fighter in a sense, or used guerrilla tactics against the Federal Army in Virginia. He actually wrote a fascinating book of memoirs, in fact. Uh, and unlike Lee, he rather repented, whereas Lee was an unreconstructed savage, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but uh, that's what happened. It could have been, I think, in another, uh, you know, the memory, you know, the South was beaten. We could have, had it, it's possible without going too self-indulgently into counterfactuals that you could have had an outcome where, yes, as you say, the war was not, is not finished in the psyches of Americans. That's absolutely right. I think you maybe lump too many things in, into it. I mean, I've seen too many brutal police forces in this world to be convinced that that's the result of, of, uh, of the of of the unfinished business of the Civil War, but on the basic things you said, I completely agree with you. Now, where you go from there in a situation where self-evidently it's not clear yet who won, uh, and you know Trump, maybe not Trump himself. I don't think Trump could find you know any of the battlefields of the Civil War on a map, uh, but. Uh, or tell you who President Hayes was, for that matter. Uh, but, uh, you know, people who support Trump are disproportionately, shall we say, people who still, uh, you know, do the, the Confederate battle flag, the one with the cross, not the official flag. Uh, and, uh, and so that, 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 the narrative of, of the virtuous South what people with a straight face as recently as the 80s called it, you know, bourgeois homes in New Orleans and Chattanooga and Savannah, the war of northern aggression. Uh, there's still a lot of that going around. So, yeah, where we go, how, it's a struggle. I mean, that's where politics comes in. I mean, you know, I mean, somebody's going to win this political struggle. I think it, the verdict is out on which side that's going to be. If Schultz wins, it might be, uh, might be the Confederate side. Uh, um, I have another question on forgetting. Um, I, am, I am not an uh, a analyst. I am an high school English teacher who is here on invitation of an analyst. Well, no, 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 okay. Um, and thank you. Um, we are, so I teach 11th graders, and the 11th graders right now are reading Beloved by Toni Morrison. And one of the lessons, um, recurring tropes, is that um, try as you might to forget, um, memory will not allow you to forget, and memory comes back. And you can try to dissociate yourself, um, but um, it's not your choice. So that is the personal, and, I, and, and, and it's interesting to think of that novel as a novel of displacement, uh, displacement and it's interesting um, uh, to think of that. Now, my question, that's personal. Um, the, 
on a parallel level, I understand, I found it sort of like your, your point with um, forgetting sort of deliciously transgressive because you're right, we do, we do, um, we are told to um, m memorialize. Um, as, a, as a culture, what, is there a sense in which we try to forget but it will also be hopeless? Well, I'm tempted just to reply to you with the famous phrase of John Maynard Keats, in the long run, we're all dead. Uh, so, I mean, in that sense, sure. I mean, uh, I mean, you know, we'll, uh, I mean, who knows, first of all, who knows what's going to happen? Uh, my argument's rather different. I mean, to come back to your personal example, I don't believe there is such a thing as collective memory. I believe that those collective memories are collective political positions or myths or analyses of the past that communities decide is morally, are morally right. You can leave a community. Anyway, you don't remember, look, individual memory and collective memory are two very different things neurologically. You remember your childhood. You don't remember the Battle of Bull Run. You have an opinion about the Battle of Bull Run or you have a feeling about the Battle of Bull Run or whatever. Communities don't remember. What they do is they form moral positions. And that's absolutely illicit. Can you escape the moral positions of communities? Well, the short answer is it depends on whether you can escape a community or not. I mean, there's certainly plenty of African-American people who are not that interested in this question. Uh, and plenty of, you know, you, you have to be careful that we, whatever you hear somebody say we, ask what they mean, who they mean, exactly. Because we is, a, you know, that's another prophylactic against thought. You know, who are we talking about? You know, the, that we. I mean, I could tell you the old Lone Ranger joke, which some of you know, but, uh, but uh, you know, it's, it's not, I don't, you see, I don't see that as memory. Now, that doesn't mean that what memorializing is necessarily the wrong thing to do. I think it's moral to try to memorialize the, let's say, the slave trade, the Middle Passage. But you don't remember it. Excuse me, you don't remember it. And indeed, when, if we're talking about something more recent, you know, the last survivors of the concentration camps will be dead in the next few years. And then we're going to be, as it were, after memory, to use an essay of a friend of mine in Washington. Uh, and that'll be a very different situation, a very different way. So I think uh, the, uh, I think that view that Tony Morrison holds, that certainly William Faulkner held, Garcia Marcus, you could argue, held, I, I think it's, it's true some of the time, but it's, it, it's not quite as any of them describe it. There's no such thing as genetic memory. Thank you for speaking with us today. Um, you spoke about messy compromise, cold peace, et cetera. And I mean this in all seriousness. Um, do you see the concept or the role of forgiveness as a personal experience? Is there such a thing as collective forgiveness? No. There's such a thing as the forgiveness in, geo in the terms of politics. A state can decide to forgive another state. You know, you can, in the sense of no longer want reparations or in practical terms, but no, of course there's no such thing as collective forgiveness. Who do, you, who do we speak for? Again, I'm back to that we. You know, I forgive you, but my pal here doesn't. In what name? Is it a plebiscite? Is it... A majority of us forgive, therefore the community forgives. Yeah, I suppose, I mean, some people would say that the Gashasha process in Rwanda was an example of communities forgiving. 
But certainly the, the, the government of Rwanda has forgiven nothing. I would argue they've also learned nothing, but that's another conversation. Uh, but the, uh, uh, I don't think you can talk about collective forgiveness. What you can talk about is time. I mean, time eventually, everything will be, remember, everything will be forgotten. Not just us, but everything. In 10,000 years, people are not going to be talking about Auschwitz. They're going to be talking about proximate track. If we last 10,000 years, we may not last 100 years. But, uh, but you, can't, you can't sacralize memory if for no other reason than that. It will all be forgotten. The question is only when. I don't claim to fully understand the package of your message. I hope it's not a package, actually. Well, I, I would like to be able to summarize it, and I don't have a clear view of how to do that for my own benefit. But I do get a feeling from it. So I'm hoping to learn from the feeling, because I think there are ways that we can outsmart ourselves and get stuck. Displacement, inner and outer. And you offered a really good takeaway about being displaced even when you have not actually been relocated. Being displaced by technology. Being displaced by a change of agriculture, which is huge, or very, the very lack important. of potable yeah. water. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I get a sense of dystopia, which is reasonable. Society has lately been like really fascinated with it. Not too long ago, there was a great obsession with mummies or <laughs> with. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you'll, have to tell, you'll have to tell me about that. Yeah, yeah, zombies. And then before then, it was vampires. But um, the feeling tone is that you're damned if you do. You're damned if you don't. You're stuck. I don't know what it's like to be a slave. But I do know my experiences as a descendant. Yep. And they're not fantasized. Yep. They're not welcomed. They're not uh, fantasized. Or they're fa not fantasies or not fantasized? I don't think they're fantasies. I'm, certainly, I have my own processing of them. Mm -hmm. But they seem to come from outside of me. I guess that is not unparalleled. To, in some way to having your home and having the other infiltrate your, your community and affect the mores and... But, you know, one of the last things that Jung had published stated that he was really disappointed that he didn't accomplish communicating fully the value of the soul. Wait, who said this? Carl Jung. Oh, sorry, yeah. Um, that, you know, along with Viktor Frankl's man's search for meaning, there is an absence of this relationship to what's internal. But I'm, I'm, I'm gonna ask you, how, how do we, versus just laying down, watching the AI take over us, um, being surrounded by a, nothing but a sense of other, internal and external, how do we get past this dystopic? Feel. 
What's the, what, how do we get into action? How do we get moved to relate to this? Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's a, look, what I also, as I did my throat clearing before talking, getting to the main things I wanted to talk about today, said that I don't know anything about psychology. And I don't. I wasn't being, this isn't false modesty. That doesn't mean I haven't read Jung and Freud and Wilhelm Reich and Alfred Adler and blah, blah, blah. Of course I have. But I don't know anything about it. It's perfectly possible to read widely and not understand all that much or not have a feeling for it. You know, uh, I don't, uh, so I meant that. So in terms of the, the work of the psyche or the work of therapists or, I mean, I have enormous respect and nothing of value to contribute to that discussion. If, however, you want to move the conversation you know, to how do you avoid dystopia, well, you avoid dystopia by struggling to make better societies that will do the things that might, maybe too late, stave off dystopia. You know, don't mourn organize and all that stuff, the wobbly said. Uh, I, I don't, you know, I only have those, you know, political and social comments to make. The work, the other work you're talking about, I'm just, I'm just not competent. It would be pretentious and ridiculous of me to pretend I had any idea where it would be worth your time to listen to. Hello. Thank you for your presentation. I would like to speak about the tragic aspect of what, of the, what displacement is. Personally, I'm a Venezuelan, which means that at this moment we're expecting our government to fall. We hope that it will happen. Three million people have been displaced. As you mentioned, some of them went to Peru. I'm also Jewish, which means that historically I have a, the psyche of displacement very much ingrained. And I have worked with this element of not being loved, not being wanted, having to move from one side to the other, not being sure in any place. How do we human beings live with that? And there is an element that I learned from a Vietnamese woman. And she did teach me, not because she wanted, but because she was in the right place in the right moment. And I. And she was talking about why she had lived so long. She was 100 years old. And she said, accept change. And so there is another way of looking at being displaced, which is having to deal with change. And the way we as individuals integrate the change we're going through. And then it is not a collective issue or a collective feat. It's individual, but if we could really see the positive in displacement and see that it pushes us to change and accept and adapt, maybe the whole tragic element of it would be less strong. I don't know how else to put it. And so that's what I wanted to comment here. Thank you. Obviously, I, I have no, nothing of interest to say except listen attentively to that comment. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. We're going to take a good uh, half hour break. So we'll start again <clears throat> in a quarter after three. Thank you. Is that okay?